December 23rd. Tresillian went to answer the doorbell. It had been an unusually aggressive peal, and now, before he could make his slow way across the hall, it peeled out again. Tresillian flushed. An ill-mannered, impatient way of ringing the bell at a gentleman's house. If it was a fresh lot of those carol singers he'd give them a piece of his mind. Through the frosted glass of the upper half of the door he saw a silhouette, a big man in a slouch hat. He opened the door. As he had thought, a cheap, flashy stranger, nasty pattern of suit he was wearing, loud. Some impudent begging fellow. Blessed if it isn't Tresillian, said the stranger. How are you, Tresillian? Tresillian stared, took a deep breath, stared again. That bold arrogant jaw, the high-bridged nose, the rollicking eye. Yes, they had all been there three years ago. More subdued then. He said with a gasp. Mr. Harry. Harry Lee laughed. Looks as though I'd given you quite a shock. Why? I'm expected, aren't I? Yes, indeed, sir. Certainly, sir. Then why the surprise act? Harry stepped back a foot or two and looked up at the house, a good solid mass of red brick, unimaginative but solid. Just the same ugly old mansion, he remarked. Still standing, though, that's the main thing. How's my father, Tresillian? He's somewhat of an invalid, sir. Keeps his room, and can't get about much. But he's wonderfully well, considering. The old sinner. Harry Lee came inside, let Tresillian remove his scarf and take the somewhat theatrical hat. How's my dear brother Alfred, Tresillian? He's very well, sir. Harry grinned. Looking forward to seeing me? Eh. I expect so, sir. I don't. Quite the contrary. I bet it's given him a nasty jolt, my turning up. Alfred and I never did get on. Ever read your Bible, Tresillian? Why, yes, sir, sometimes, sir. Remember the tale of the prodigal's return? The good brother didn't like it, remember? Didn't like it at all. Good old stay-at-home Alfred doesn't like it either, I bet. Tresillian remained silent looking down his nose. His stiffened back expressed protest. Harry clapped him on the shoulder. Lead on, old son, he said. The fatted calf awaits me. Lead me right to it. Tresillian murmured. If you will come this way into the drawing room, sir. I am not quite sure where everyone is, they were unable to send to meet you, sir, not knowing the time of your arrival. Harry nodded. He followed Tresillian along the hall, turning his head to look about him as he went. All the old exhibits in their place, I see, he remarked. I don't believe anything has changed since I went away twenty years ago. He followed Tresillian into the drawing room. The old man murmured. I will see if I can find Mr. or Mrs. Alfred, and hurried out. Harry Lee had marched into the room and had then stopped, staring at the figure who was seated on one of the windowsills. His eyes roamed incredulously over the black hair and the creamy exotic pallor. Good Lord, he said. Are you my father's seventh and most beautiful wife? Pilar slipped down and came towards him. I am Pilar Estravados, she announced. And you must be my uncle Harry, my mother's brother. Harry said, staring. So that's who you are. Jenny's daughter. Pilar said, why did you ask me if I was your father's seventh wife? Has he really had six wives? Harry laughed. No, I believe he's only had one official one. Well, Pil, what's your name? Pilar, yes. Well, Pilar, it really gives me quite a turn to see something like you blooming in this mausoleum. This, mouse, please. This museum of stuffed dummies. I always thought this house was lousy. 
Now I see it again I think it's lousier than ever. Pilar said in a shocked voice. Oh, no, it is very handsome here. The furniture is good and the carpets, thick carpets everywhere, and there are lots of ornaments. Everything is very good quality and very, very rich. You're right there, said Harry, grinning. He looked at her with amusement. You know, I can't help getting a kick out of seeing you in the midst. He broke off as Lydia came rapidly into the room. She came straight to him. How'd you do, Harry? I'm Lydia, Alfred's wife. How to do, Lydia? He shook hands, examining her intelligent mobile face in a swift glance and approving mentally of the way she walked, very few women moved well. Lydia in her turn took quick stock of him. She thought, he looks a frightful tough, attractive though. I wouldn't trust him an inch. She said smiling. How does it look after all these years? Quite different, or very much the same. Pretty much the same. He looked round him. This room's been done over. Oh, many times. He said. I meant by you. You've made it, different. Yes, I expect so. He grinned at her, a sudden impish grin that reminded her with a start of the old man upstairs. It's got more class about it now. I remember hearing that old Alfred had married a girl whose people came over with the conqueror. Lydia smiled. She said. I believe they did. But they've rather run to seed since those days. Harry said. How's old Alfred? Just the same blessed old stick in the mud as ever. I've no idea whether you will find him changed or not. How are the others? Scattered all over England. No, they're all here for Christmas, you know. Harry's eyes opened. Regular Christmas family reunion. What's the matter with the old man? He used not to give a damn for sentiment. Don't remember his caring much for his family, either. He must have changed. Perhaps. Lydia's voice was dry. Pilar was staring, her big eyes wide and interested. Harry said. How's old George? Still the same skinflint. How he used to howl if he had to part with a halfpenny of his pocket money. Lydia said. George is in Parliament. He's member for Westeringham. What? Popeye in Parliament? Lord, that's good. Harry threw back his head and laughed. It was rich stentorian laughter, it sounded uncontrolled and brutal in the confined space of the room. Pilar drew in her breath with a gasp. Lydia flinched a little. Then, at a movement behind him, Harry broke off his laugh and turned sharply. He had not heard anyone coming in, but Alfred was standing there quietly. He was looking at Harry with an odd expression on his face. Harry stood a minute, then a slow smile crept to his lips. He advanced a step. Why, he said, it's Alfred. Alfred nodded. Hello, Harry, he said. They stood staring at each other. Lydia caught her breath. She thought. How absurd. Like two dogs, looking at each other. Pilar's gaze widened even further. She thought to herself. How silly they look standing there, why do they not embrace? No, of course the English do not do that. But they might say something. Why do they just look? Harry said at last. Well, well. Feels funny to be here again. I expect so, yes. A good many years since you, got out. Harry threw up his head. He drew his finger along the line of his jaw. It was a gesture that was habitual with him. It expressed belligerence. Yes he said. I'm glad I have come, he paused to bring out the word with greater significance, home. I've been, I suppose, a very wicked man, said Simeon Lee. 
he was leaning back in his chair. His chin was raised and with one finger he was stroking his jaw reflectively. In front of him a big fire glowed and danced. Beside it sat Pilar. A little screen of papier-mâché held in her hand. With it she shielded her face from the blaze. Occasionally she fanned herself with it, using her wrist in a supple gesture. Simeon looked at her with satisfaction. He went on talking, perhaps more to himself than to the girl, and stimulated by the fact of her presence. Yes, he said. I've been a wicked man. What do you say to that, Pilar? Pilar shrugged her shoulders. She said. All men are wicked. The nuns say so. That is why one has to pray for them. Ah, but I've been more wicked than most. Simeon laughed. I don't regret it, you know. No, I don't regret anything. I've enjoyed myself, every minute. They say you repent when you get old. That's bunkum. I don't repent. And as I tell you, I've done most things, all the good old sins. I've cheated and stolen and lied, Lord, yes. And women, always women. Someone told me the other day of an Arab chief who had a bodyguard of forty of his sons, all roughly the same age. Aha! Forty! I don't know about forty, but I bet I could produce a very fair bodyguard if I went about looking for the brats. Hey, Pilar, what do you think of that? Shocked. Pilar stared. No, why should I be shocked? Men always desire women. My father, too. That is why wives are so often unhappy and why they go to church and pray. Old Simeon was frowning. I made Adelaide unhappy, he said. He spoke almost under his breath, to himself. Lord, what a woman. Pink and white and pretty as they make M when I married her. And afterwards? Always wailing and weeping. It rouses the devil in a man when his wife is always crying, she'd no guts, that's what was the matter with Adelaide. If she'd stood up to me. But she never did, not once. I believed when I married her that I was going to be able to settle down, raise a family, cut loose from the old life. His voice died away. He stared, stared into the glowing heart of the fire. Raise a family, God. What a family. He gave a sudden shrill pipe of angry laughter. Look at them, look at them. Not a child among them, to carry on. What's the matter with them? Haven't they got any of my blood in their veins? Not a son among them, legitimate or illegitimate. Alfred, for instance, heavens above, how bored I get with Alfred. Looking at me with his dog's eyes ready to do anything I ask. Lord, what a fool. His wife, now, Lydia, I like Lydia. She's got spirit. She doesn't like me, though. No, she doesn't like me. But she has to put up with me for that nincompoop Alfred's sake. He looked over at the girl by the fire. Pilar, remember, nothing is so boring as devotion. She smiled at him. He went on, warmed by the presence of her youth and strong femininity. George. What's George? A stick. A stuffed codfish. A pompous windbag with no brains and no guts, and mean about money as well. David. David always was a fool, a fool and a dreamer. His mother's boy, that was always David. Only sensible thing he ever did was to marry that solid comfortable looking woman. He brought down his hand with a bang on the edge of his chair. Harry's the best of M. Poor old Harry, the wrong un. But at any rate he's alive. Pilar agreed. Yes, he is nice. He laughs, laughs out loud, and throws his head back. Oh, yes, I like him very much. The old man looked at her. You do, do you, P. 
Pilar. Harry always had a way with the girls. Takes after me there. He began to laugh, a slow wheezy chuckle. I've had a good life, a very good life. Plenty of everything. Pilar said. In Spain we have a proverb. It is like this. Take what you like and pay for it, says God. Simeon beat an appreciative hand on the arm of his chair. That's good. That's the stuff. Take what you like, I've done that, all my life, taken what I wanted. Pilar said, her voice high and clear, and suddenly arresting. And you have paid for it. Simeon stopped laughing to himself. He sat up and stared at her. He said, what's that you say? I said, have you paid for it, grandfather? Simeon Lee said slowly. I, don't know. Then, beating his fist on the arm of the chair, he cried out with sudden anger. What makes you say that, girl? What makes you say that? Pilar said. I, wondered. Her hand, holding the screen, was arrested. Her eyes were dark and mysterious. She sat, her head thrown back, conscious of herself, of her womanhood. Simeon said. You devil's brat. She said softly. But you like me, grandfather. You like me to sit here with you. Simeon said, yes, I like it. It's a long time since I've seen anything so young and beautiful, it does me good, warms my old bones, and you're my own flesh and blood, good for Jennifer, she turned out to be the best of the bunch after all. Pilar sat there smiling. Mind you, you don't fool me, said Simeon. I know why you sit here so patiently and listen to me droning on. It's money, it's all money, or do you pretend you love your old grandfather? Pilar said, no, I do not love you. But I like you. I like you very much. You must believe that, for it is true. I think you have been wicked, but I like that too. You are more real than the other people in this house. And you have interesting things to say. You have traveled and you have led a life of adventure. If I were a man I would be like that, too. Simeon nodded. Yes, I believe you would, we've gypsy blood in us, so it's always been said. It hasn't shown much in my children, except Harry, but I think it's come out in you. I can be patient, mind you, when it's necessary. I waited once fifteen years to get even with a man who'd done me an injury. That's another characteristic of the Lees, they don't forget. They'll avenge a wrong if they have to wait years to do it. A man swindled me. I waited fifteen years till I saw my chance, and then I struck. I ruined him. Cleaned him right out. He laughed softly. Pilar said. That was in South Africa. Yes. A grand country. You have been back there, yes. I went back last five years after I married. That was the last time. But before that? You were there for many years. Yes. Tell me about it. He began to talk. Pilar, shielding her face, listened. His voice slowed, wearied. He said. Wait, I'll show you something. He pulled himself carefully to his feet. Then, with his stick, he limped slowly across the room. He opened the big safe. Turning, he beckoned her to him. There, look at these. Feel them, let them run through your fingers. He looked into her wondering face and laughed. Do you know what they are? Diamonds, child, diamonds. Pilar's eyes opened. She said as she bent over. But they are little pebbles, that is all. Simeon laughed. They are uncut diamonds. That is how they are found, like this. Pilar asked incredulously. And if they were cut they would be real diamonds? Certainly. They would flash and sparkle. 
Flash and sparkle. Pilar said childishly. Oh oh oh, I cannot believe it. He was amused. It's quite true. They are valuable. Fairly valuable. Difficult to say before they are cut. Anyway, this little lot is worth several thousands of pounds. Pilar said with a space between each word. Several, thousands, of, pounds. Say nine or ten thousands, they're biggish stones, you see. Pilar asked, her eyes opening. But why do you not sell them, then? Because I like to have them here. But all that money? I don't need the money. Oh, I see, Pilar looked impressed. She said. But why do you not have them cut and made beautiful? Because I prefer them like this. His face was set in a grim line. He turned away and began speaking to himself. They take me back, the touch of them, the feel of them through my fingers, it all comes back to me, the sunshine, and the smell of the veldt, the oxen, old E.B., all the boys, the evenings. There was a soft tap on the door. Simeon said, put M back in the safe and bang it to. Then he called, come in. Horbury came in, soft and deferential. He said, tea is ready downstairs. Hilda said, so there you are, David. I've been looking for you everywhere. Don't let stay in this room, it's so frightfully cold. David did not answer for a minute. He was standing looking at a chair, a low chair with faded satin upholstery. He said abruptly. That's her chair, the chair she always sat in, just the same, it's just the same. Only faded, of course. A little frown creased Hilda's forehead. She said. I see. Do let's come out of here, David. It's frightfully cold. David took no notice. Looking round, he said. She sat in here mostly. I remember sitting on that stool there while she read to me. Jack the Giant Killer, that was it, Jack the Giant Killer. I must have been six years old then. Hilda put a firm hand through his arm. Come back to the drawing room, dear. There's no heating in this room. He turned obediently, but she felt a little shiver go through him. Just the same, he murmured. Just the same. As though time had stood still. Hilda looked worried. She said in a cheerful determined voice. I wonder where the others are. It must be nearly tea time. David disengaged his arm and opened another door. There used to be a piano in here, oh, yes, here it is. I wonder if it's in tune. He sat down and opened the lid, running his hands lightly over the keys. Yes, it's evidently kept tuned. He began to play. His touch was good, the melody flowed out from under his fingers. Hilda asked, what is that? I seem to know it, and I can't quite remember. He said, I haven't played it for years. She used to play it. One of Mendelssohn's songs without words. The sweet, oversweet, melody filled the room. Hilda said. Play some Mozart, do. David shook his head. He began another Mendelssohn. Then suddenly he brought his hands down upon the keys in a harsh discord. He got up. He was trembling all over. Hilda went to him. She said, David, David. He said, it's nothing, it's nothing. The bell pealed aggressively. Tresillian rose from his seat in the pantry and went slowly out and along to the door. The bell pealed again. Tresillian frowned. Through the frosted glass of the door he saw the silhouette of a man wearing a slouch hat. Tresillian passed a hand over his forehead. Something worried him. It was as though everything was happening twice. Surely this had happened before. Surely. He drew back the latch and opened the door. Then the spell broke. 
The man standing there said. Is this where Mr. Simeon Lee lives? Yes, sir. I'd like to see him, please. A faint echo of memory awoke in Tresillian. It was an intonation of voice that he remembered from the old days when Mr. Lee was first in England. Tresillian shook his head dubiously. Mr. Lee is an invalid, sir. He doesn't see many people now. If you... The stranger interrupted. He drew out an envelope and handed it to the butler. Please give this to Mr. Lee. Yes, sir. Simeon Lee took the envelope. He drew out the single sheet of paper it held. He looked surprised. His eyebrows rose, but he smiled. By all that's wonderful, he said. Then to the butler, show Mr. Far up here, Tresillian. Yes, sir. Simeon said, I was just thinking of old Ebenezer Farr. He was my partner out there in Kimberley. Now here's his son come along. Tresillian reappeared. He announced, Mr. Farr. Stephen Farr came in with a trace of nervousness. He disguised it by putting on a little extra swagger. He said, and just for the moment his South African accent was more marked than usual, Mr. Lee. I'm glad to see you. So you're E.B.'s boy. Stephen Farr grinned rather sheepishly. He said, my first visit to the old country. Father always told me to look you up if I did come. Quite right. The old man looked round. This is my granddaughter, Pilar Estravados. How do you do, said Pilar demurely. Stephen Farr thought with a touch of admiration. Cool little devil. She was surprised to see me, but it only showed for a flash. He said, rather heavily, I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance, Miss Estravados. Thank you, said Pilar. Simeon Lee said, sit down and tell me all about yourself. Are you in England for long? Oh, I shan't hurry myself now I've really got here. He laughed, throwing his head back. Simeon Lee said, quite right. You must stay here with us for a while. Oh, look here, sir. I can't but in like that. It's only two days to Christmas. You must spend Christmas with us, unless you've got other plans. Well, no, I haven't, but I don't like. Simeon said, that's settled. He turned his head. Pilar. Yes, grandfather. Go and tell Lydia we shall have another guest. Ask her to come up here. Pilar left the room. Stephen's eyes followed her. Simeon noted the fact with amusement. He said, you've come straight here from South Africa. Pretty well. They began to talk of that country. Lydia entered a few minutes later. Simeon said, this is Stephen Farr, son of my old friend and partner, Ebenezer Farr. He's going to be with us for Christmas if you can find room for him. Lydia smiled. Of course. Her eyes took in the stranger's appearance. His bronzed face and blue eyes and the easy backward tilt of his head. My daughter-in-law, said Simeon. Stephen said, I feel rather embarrassed, butting in on a family party like this. You're one of the family, my boy, said Simeon. Think of yourself as that. You're too kind, sir. Pilar re-entered the room. She sat down quietly by the fire and picked up the hand screen. She used it as a fan, slowly tilting her wrist to and fro. Her eyes were demure and downcast. December 24th. Do you really want me to stay on here, father? asked Harry. He tilted his head back. I'm stirring up rather a hornet's nest, you know. What do you mean? asked Simeon sharply. Brother Alfred, said Harry. Good brother Alfred. He, if I may say so, 
resents my presence here. The devil he does, snapped Simeon. I'm master in this house. All the same, sir, I expect you're pretty dependent on Alfred. I don't want to upset. You'll do as I tell you, snapped his father. Harry yawned. Don't know that I shall be able to stick a stay-at-home life. Pretty stifling to a fellow who's knocked about the world. His father said, you'd better marry and settle down. Harry said, who shall I marry? Pity one can't marry one's niece. Young Pilar is devilish attractive. You've noticed that? Talking of settling down, Fat George has done well for himself as far as looks go. Who was she? Simeon shrugged his shoulders. How should I know? George picked her up at a mannequin parade, I believe. She says her father was a retired naval officer. Harry said. Probably a second mate of a coasting steamer. George will have a bit of trouble with her if he's not careful. George, said Simeon Lee, is a fool. Harry said, what did she marry him for, his money? Simeon shrugged his shoulders. Harry said, well, you think that you can square Alfred all right? We'll soon settle that, said Simeon grimly. He touched a bell that stood on a table near him. Horbury appeared promptly. Simeon said. Ask Mr. Alfred to come here. Horbury went out and Harry drawled. That fellow listens at doors. Simeon shrugged his shoulders. Probably. Alfred hurried in. His face twitched when he saw his brother. Ignoring Harry, he said pointedly. You wanted me, father? Yes, sit down. I was just thinking we must reorganize things a bit now that we have two more people living in the house. 2. Pilar will make her home here, naturally. And Harry is home for good. Alfred said, Harry is coming to live here. Why not, old boy, said Harry. Alfred turned sharply to him. I should think that you yourself would see that. Well, sorry, but I don't. After everything that has happened. The disgraceful way you behaved. The scandal. Harry waved an easy hand. All that's in the past, old boy. You behaved abominably to father, after all he's done for you. Look here, Alfred, it strikes me that's father's business, not yours. If he's willing to forgive and forget. I'm willing, said Simeon. Harry's my son, after all, you know, Alfred. Yes, but, I resent it, for father's sake. Simeon said, Harry's coming here. I wish it. He laid a hand gently on the latter's shoulder. I'm very fond of Harry. Alfred got up and left the room. His face was white. Harry rose too and went after him, laughing. Simeon sat chuckling to himself. Then he started and looked round. Who the devil's that? Oh, it's you, Horbury. Don't creep about that way. I beg your pardon, sir. Never mind. Listen, I've got some orders for you. I want everybody to come up here after lunch, everybody. Yes, sir. There's something else. When they come, you come with them. And when you get halfway along the passage raise your voice so that I can hear. Any pretext will do. Understand? Yes, sir. Horbury went downstairs. He said to Tresillian. If you ask me, we are going to have a Merry Christmas. Tresillian said sharply, What do you mean? You wait and see, Mr. Tresillian. It's Christmas Eve today, and a nice Christmas spirit abroad, I don't think. They came into the room and paused at the doorway. Simeon was speaking into the telephone. He waved a hand to them. Sit down, all of you. I shan't be a minute. He went on speaking into the telephone. Is that Charlton, Hodgkins and Bruce? Is that you, 
Charlton. Simeon Lee speaking. Yes, isn't it? Yes, no, I wanted you to make a new will for me, yes, it's some time since I made the other, circumstances have altered, oh no, no hurry. Don't want you to spoil your Christmas. Say Boxing Day or the day after. Come along, and I'll tell you what I want done. No, that's quite all right. I shan't be dying just yet. He replaced the receiver, then looked round at the eight members of his family. He cackled and said. You're all looking very glum. What is the matter? Alfred said, you sent for us. Simeon said quickly, oh, sorry, nothing portentous about it. Did you think it was a family council? No, I'm just rather tired today, that's all. None of you need come up after dinner. I shall go to bed. I want to be fresh for Christmas Day. He grinned at them. George said earnestly. Of course, of course. Simeon said, grand old institution, Christmas. Promotes solidarity of family feeling. What do you think, Magdalene, my dear? Magdalene Lee jumped. Her rather silly little mouth flew open and then shut itself. She said, oh, oh, yes. Simeon said, let me see, you lived with a retired naval officer, he paused, your father. Don't suppose you made much of Christmas. It needs a big family for that. Well, well, yes, perhaps it does. Simeon's eyes slid past her. Don't want to talk of anything unpleasant at this time of year, but you know, George, I'm afraid I'll have to cut down your allowance a bit. My establishment here is going to cost me a bit more to run in future. George got very red. But look here, father, you can't do that. Simeon said softly, oh, can't I? My expenses are very heavy already. Very heavy. As it is, I don't know how I make both ends meet. It needs the most rigorous economy. Let your wife do a bit more of it, said Simeon. Women are good at that sort of thing. They often think of economies where a man would never have dreamt of them. And a clever woman can make her own clothes. My wife, I remember, was clever with her needle. About all she was clever with, a good woman, but deadly dull. David sprang up. His father said. Sit down, boy, you'll knock something over. David said, my mother. Simeon said, your mother had the brains of a louse. And it seems to me she's transmitted those brains to her children. He raised himself up suddenly. A red spot appeared on each cheek. His voice came high and shrill. You're not worth a penny piece, any of you. I'm sick of you all. You're not men. You're weaklings, a set of namby-pamby weaklings. Pilar's worth any two of you put together. I'll swear to heaven I've got a better son somewhere in the world than any of you, even if you are born the right side of the blanket. Here, father, hold hard, cried Harry. He had jumped up and stood there, a frown on his usually good-humored face. Simeon snapped. The same goes for you. What have you ever done? Wine to me for money from all over the world. I tell you I'm sick of the sight of you all. Get out. He leaned back in his chair, panting a little. Slowly, one by one, his family went out. George was red and indignant. Magdalene looked frightened. David was pale and quivering. Harry blustered out of the room. Alfred went like a man in a dream. Lydia followed him with her head held high. Only Hilda paused in the doorway and came slowly back. She stood over him, and he started when he opened his eyes and found her standing there. There was something menacing in the solid way she stood there quite immovably. He said irritably, what is it? Hilda said, when your letter came I believed what you said, that you wanted your family round you for Christmas, I persuaded David to come. 
Simeon said, well, what of it? Hilda said slowly, you did want your family round you, but not for the purpose you said. You wanted them there, didn't you, in order to set them all by the ears? God help you, it's your idea of fun. Simeon chuckled. He said, I always had rather a specialized sense of humor. I don't expect anyone else to appreciate the joke. I'm enjoying it. She said nothing. A vague feeling of apprehension came over Simeon Lee. He said sharply. What are you thinking about? Hilda Lee said slowly, I'm afraid. Simeon said, you're afraid, of me. Hilda said, not of you. I'm afraid, for you. Like a judge who has delivered sentence, she turned away. She marched, slowly and heavily, out of the room. Simeon sat staring at the door. Then he got to his feet and made his way over to the safe. He murmured, let's have a look at my beauties. The doorbell rang about a quarter to eight. Tresillian went to answer it. He returned to his pantry to find Horbury there, picking up the coffee cups off the tray and looking at the mark on them. Who was it, said Horbury. Superintendent of Police, Mr. Sugden, mind what you're doing. Horbury had dropped one of the cups with a crash. Look at that now, lamented Tresillian. Eleven years I've had the washing up of those and never one broken, and now you come along touching things you've no business to touch, and look what happens. I'm sorry, Mr. Tresillian. I am indeed, the other apologized. His face was covered with perspiration. I don't know how it happened. Did you say a superintendent of police had called? Yes, Mr. Sugden. The valet passed a tongue over Pal. Ellipse. What, what did he want? Collecting for the police orphanage. Oh. The valet straightened his shoulders. In a more natural voice he said. Did he get anything? I took up the book to old Mr. Lee and he told me to fetch the superintendent up and to put the sherry on the table. Nothing but begging, this time of year, said Horbury. The old devil's generous, I will say that for him, in spite of his other failings. Tresillian said with dignity. Mr. Lee has always been an open-handed gentleman. Horbury nodded. It's the best thing about him. Well, I'll be off now. Going to the pictures. I expect so. Ta-ta, Mr. Tresillian. He went through the door that led to the servants' hall. Tresillian looked up at the clock hanging on the wall. He went into the dining room and laid the rolls in the napkins. Then, after assuring himself that everything was as it should be, he sounded the gong in the hall. As the last note died away the police superintendent came down the stairs. Superintendent Sugden was a large handsome man. He wore a tightly buttoned blue suit and moved with a sense of his own importance. He said affably, I rather think we shall have a frost tonight. Good thing, the weather's been very unseasonable lately. Tresillian said, shaking his head. The damp affects my rheumatism. The superintendent said that the rheumatism was a painful complaint, and Tresillian let him out by the front door. The old butler refastened the door and came back slowly into the hall. He passed his hand over his eyes and sighed. Then he straightened his back as he saw Lydia pass into the drawing room. George Lee was just coming down the stairs. Tresillian hovered ready. When the last guest, Magdalene, had entered the drawing room, he made his own appearance, murmuring. Dinner is served. In his way Tresillian was a connoisseur of ladies' dress. He always noted and criticized the gowns of the ladies as he circled round the table, decanter in hand. Mrs. Alfred, he noted, had got on her new flowered black and white taffeta. A bold design, very striking, but she could carry it off, though many ladies couldn't. The dress Mrs. George had on was a model, he was pretty sure of that. Must have cost a pretty penny. 
he wondered how Mr. George would like paying for it. Mr. George didn't like spending money, he never had. Mrs. David now, a nice lady, but didn't have any idea of how to dress. For her figure, plain black velvet would have been the best. Figured velvet and crimson at that was a bad choice. Miss Pilar, now, it didn't matter what she wore, with her figure and her hair she looked well in anything. A flimsy cheap little white gown it was, though. Still, Mr. Lee would soon see to that. Taken to her wonderful, he had. Always was the same way when a gentleman was elderly. A young face could do anything with him. Hawk or claret, murmured Tresillian in a deferential whisper in Mrs. George's ear. Out of the tail of his eye he noted that Walter, the footman, was handing the vegetables before the gravy again, after all he had been told. Tresillian went round with the souffle. It struck him, now that his interest in the ladies' toilettes and his misgivings over Walter's deficiencies were a thing of the past, that everyone was very silent tonight. At least, not exactly silent, Mr. Harry was talking enough for twenty, no, not Mr. Harry, the South African gentleman. And the others were talking too, but only, as it were, in spasms. There was something a little, queer about them. Mr. Alfred, for instance, he looked downright ill. As though he had had a shock or something. Quite dazed he looked and just turning over the food on his plate without eating it. The mistress, she was worried about him. Tresillian could see that. Kept looking down the table towards him, not noticeably, of course, just quietly. Mr. George was very red in the face, gobbling his food, he was, without tasting it. He'd get a stroke one day if he wasn't careful. Mrs. George wasn't eating. Slimming, as likely as not. Miss Pilar seemed to be enjoying her food all right and talking and laughing up at the South African gentleman. Properly taken with her, he was. Didn't seem to be anything on their minds. Mr. David? Tresillian felt worried about Mr. David. Just like his mother, he was, to look at. And remarkably young looking still. But nervy, there, he'd knocked over his glass. Tresillian whisked it away, mopped up the stream deftly. It was all over. Mr. David hardly seemed to notice what he had done, just sat staring in front of him with a white face. Thinking of white faces, funny the way Horbury had looked in the pantry just now when he'd heard a police officer had come to the house, almost as though. Tresillian's mind stopped with a jerk. Walter had dropped a pair off the dish he was handing. Footmen were no good nowadays. They might be stable boys, the way they went on. He went round with the port. Mr. Harry seemed a bit distraught tonight. Kept looking at Mr. Alfred. Never had been any love lost between those two, not even as boys. Mr. Harry, of course, had always been his father's favorite, and that had rankled with Mr. Alfred. Mr. Lee had never cared for Mr. Alfred much. A pity, when Mr. Alfred always seemed so devoted to his father. There, Mrs. Alfred was getting up now. She swept round the table. Very nice that design on the taffeta, that cape suited her. A very graceful lady. He went out to the pantry, closing the dining room door on the gentlemen with their port. He took the coffee tray into the drawing room. The four ladies were sitting there rather uncomfortably, he thought. They were not talking. He handed round the coffee in silence. He went out again. As he went into his pantry he heard the dining room door open. David Lee came out and went along the hall to the drawing room. Tresillian went back into his pantry. He read the riot act to Walter. Walter was nearly, if not quite, impertinent. Tresillian, alone in his pantry, sat down rather wearily. He had a feeling of depression. Christmas Eve, and all this strain and tension, he didn't like it. With an effort he roused himself. 
he went to the drawing room and collected the coffee cups. The room was empty except for Lydia, who was standing half concealed by the window curtain at the far end of the room. She was standing there looking out into the night. From next door the piano sounded. Mr. David was playing. But why, Tresillian asked himself, did Mr. David play the dead march? For that's what it was. Oh, indeed things were very wrong. He went slowly along the hall and back into his pantry. It was then he first heard the noise from overhead, a crashing of china, the overthrowing of furniture, a series of cracks and bumps. Good gracious, thought Tresillian. Whatever is the master doing? What's happening up there? And then, clear and high, came a scream, a horrible high wailing scream that died away in a choke or gurgle. Tresillian stood there a moment paralyzed, then he ran out into the hall and up the broad staircase. Others were with him. That scream had been heard all over the house. They raced up the stairs and round the bend, past a recess with statues gleaming white and eerie, and along the straight passage to Simeon Lee's door. Mr. Farr was there already and Mrs. David. She was leaning back against the wall and he was twisting at the door handle. The door's locked, he was saying. The door's locked. Harry Lee pushed past and wrested it from him. He, too, turned and twisted at the handle. Father, he shouted. Father, let us in. He held up his hand and in the silence they all listened. There was no answer. No sound from inside the room. The front door bell rang, but no one paid any attention to it. Stephen Farr said. We've got to break the door down. It's the only way. Harry said, that's going to be a tough job. These doors are good solid stuff. Come on, Alfred. They heaved and strained. Finally they went and got an oak bench and used it as a battering ram. The door gave at last. Its hinges splintered and the door sank shuddering from its frame. For a minute they stood there huddled together looking in. What they saw was a sight that no one of them ever forgot. There had clearly been a terrific struggle. Heavy furniture was overturned. China vases lay splintered on the floor. In the middle of the hearthrug in front of the blazing fire lay Simeon Lee in a great pool of blood, blood was splashed all round. The place was like a shambles. There was a long shuddering sigh, and then two voices spoke in turn. Strangely enough, the words they uttered were both quotations. David Lee said. The mills of God grind slowly. Lydia's voice came like a fluttering whisper. Who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Superintendent Sugden had rung the bell three times. Finally, in desperation, he pounded on the knocker. A scared Walter at length opened the door. Who are, he said. A look of relief came over his face. I was just ringing up the police. What for, said Superintendent Sugden sharply. What's going on here? Walter whispered. It's old Mr. Lee. He's been done in. The superintendent pushed past him and ran up the stairs. He came into the room without anyone being aware of his entrance. As he entered he saw Pilar bend forward and pick up something from the floor. He saw David Lee standing with his hands over his eyes. He saw the others huddled into a little group. Alfred Lee alone had stepped near his father's body. He stood now quite close, looking down. His face was blank. George Lee was saying importantly. Nothing must be touched, remember that, nothing, till the police arrive. That is most important. Excuse me said Sugden. He pushed his way forward, gently thrusting the ladies aside. Alfred Lee recognized him. Ah, he said. It's you, Superintendent Sugden. You've got here very quickly. Yes, Mr. Lee. 
Superintendent Sugden did not waste time on explanations. What's all this? My father, said Alfred Lee, has been killed, murdered. His voice broke. Magdalene began suddenly to sob hysterically. Superintendent Sugden held up a large official hand. He said authoritatively. Will everybody kindly leave the room except Mr. Lee and Mr. George Lee? They moved slowly towards the door, reluctantly, like sheep. Superintendent Sugden intercepted Pilar suddenly. Excuse me, miss, he said pleasantly. Nothing must be touched or disturbed. She stared at him. Stephen Farr said impatiently. Of course not. She understands that. Superintendent Sugden said, still in the same pleasant manner, you picked up something from the floor just now. Pilar's eyes opened. She stared and said incredulously, I did. Superintendent Sugden was still pleasant. His voice was just a little firmer. Yes, I saw you. Oh. So please give it to me. It's in your hand now. Slowly Pilar unclosed her hand. There lay in it a wisp of rubber and a small object made of wood. Superintendent Sugden took them, enclosed them in an envelope and put them away in his breast pocket. He said, thank you. He turned away. Just for a minute Stephen Farr's eyes showed a startled respect. It was as though he had underestimated the large handsome superintendent. They went slowly out of the room. Behind them they heard the superintendent's voice saying officially. And now, if you please. Nothing like a wood fire, said Colonel Johnson as he threw on an additional log and then drew his chair nearer to the blaze. Help yourself, he added, hospitably calling attention to the tantalus and siphon that stood near his guest's elbow. The guest raised a polite hand in negation. Cautiously he edged his own chair nearer to the blazing logs, though he was of the opinion that the opportunity for roasting the soles of one's feet, like some medieval torture, did not offset the cold draft that swirled round the back of the shoulders. Colonel Johnson, Chief Constable of Middleshire, might be of the opinion that nothing could beat a wood fire, but Hercule Poirot was of the opinion that central heating could and did every time. Amazing business that Cartwright case, remarked the host reminiscently. Amazing man. Enormous charm of manner. Why, when he came here with you, he had us all eating out of his hand. He shook his head. We'll never have anything like that case, he said. Nicotine poisoning is rare, fortunately. There was a time when you would have considered all poisoning un-English, suggested Hercule Poirot. A device of foreigners. Unsportsmanlike. I hardly think we could say that, said the chief constable. Plenty of poisoning by arsenic, probably a good deal more than has ever been suspected. Possibly, yes. Always an awkward business, a poisoning case, said Johnson. Conflicting testimony of the experts, then doctors are usually so extremely cautious in what they say. Always a difficult case to take to a jury. No, if one must have murder, which heaven forbid, give me a straightforward case. Something where there's no ambiguity about the cause of death. Poirot nodded. The bullet wound, the cut throat, the crushed in skull. It is there your preference lies. Oh, don't call it a preference, my dear fellow. Don't harbor the idea that I like murder cases. Hope I never have another. Anyway, we ought to be safe enough during your visit. Poirot began modestly. My reputation. But Johnson had gone on. Christmas time, he said. Peace, goodwill, and all that kind of thing. Goodwill all round. Hercule Poirot leaned back in his chair. He joined his fingertips. He studied his host thoughtfully. He murmured, it is, then, your opinion that Christmas time is an unlikely season for crime? That's what I said. Why? Why? 
Johnson was thrown slightly out of his stride. Well, as I've just said, season of good cheer, and all that. Hercule Poirot murmured. The British, they are so sentimental. Johnson said stoutly, what if we are? What if we do like the old ways, the old traditional festivities? What's the harm? There is no harm. It is almost charming. But let us for a moment examine facts. You have said that Christmas is a season of good cheer. That means, does it not, a lot of eating and drinking? It means, in fact, the overeating. And with the overeating there comes the indigestion. And with the indigestion there comes the irritability. Crimes, said Colonel Johnson, are not committed from irritability. I am not so sure. Take another point. There is, at Christmas, a spirit of goodwill. It is, as you say, the thing to do. Old quarrels are patched up, those who have disagreed consent to agree once more, even if it is only temporarily. Johnson nodded. Bury the hatchet, that's right. Poirot pursued his theme. And families now, families who have been separated throughout the year, assemble once more together. Now under these conditions, my friend, you must admit that there will occur a great amount of strain. People who do not feel amiable are putting great pressure on themselves to appear amiable. There is at Christmas time a great deal of hypocrisy, honorable hypocrisy, hypocrisy undertaken pour le bon motif, say entendu, but nevertheless hypocrisy. Well, I shouldn't put it quite like that myself, said Colonel Johnson doubtfully. Poirot beamed upon him. No, no. It is I who am putting it like that, not you. I am pointing out to you that under these conditions, mental strain, physical malaise, it is highly probable that dislikes that were before merely mild and disagreements that were trivial might suddenly assume a more serious character. The result of pretending to be a more amiable, a more forgiving, a more high-minded person than one really is, has sooner or later the effect of causing one to behave as a more disagreeable, a more ruthless and an altogether more unpleasant person than is actually the case. If you damn the stream of natural behavior, mon ami, sooner or later the dam bursts and a cataclysm occurs. Colonel Johnson looked at him doubtfully. Never know when you're serious and when you're pulling my leg, he grumbled. Poirot smiled at him. I am not serious. Not in the least am I serious. But all the same, it is true what I say, artificial conditions bring about their natural reaction. Colonel Johnson's manservant entered the room. Superintendent Sugden on the phone, sir. Right. I'll come. With a word of apology the chief constable left the room. He returned some three minutes later. His face was grave and perturbed. Damn it all, he said. Case of murder. On Christmas Eve, too. Poirot's eyebrows rose. It is that definitely, murder, I mean. Eh. Oh, no other solution possible. Perfectly clear case. Murder, and a brutal murder at that. Who is the victim? Old Simeon Lee. One of the richest men we've got. Made his money in South Africa originally. Gold, no, diamonds, I believe. He sunk an immense fortune in manufacturing some particular gadget of mining machinery. His own invention, I believe. Anyway, it's paid him hand over fist. They say he's a millionaire twice over. Poirot said, he was well liked, yes. Johnson said slowly. Don't think anyone liked him. Queer sort of chap. He's been an invalid for some years now. I don't know very much about him myself. But of course he is one of the big figures of the county. So this case, it will make a big stir. Yes. I must get over to Longdale as fast as I can. He hesitated, looking at his guest. Poirot answered the unspoken question. You would like that I should accompany you. 
Johnson said awkwardly. Seems a shame to ask you. But, well, you know how it is. Superintendent Sugden is a good man, none better, painstaking, careful, thorough. Why sound, but, well, he's not an imaginative chap in any way. Should like very much, as you are here, benefit of your advice. He halted a little over the end part of his speech, making it somewhat telegraphic in style. Poirot responded quickly. I shall be delighted. You can count on me to assist you in any way I can. We must not hurt the feelings of the good superintendent. It will be his case, not mine. I am only the unofficial consultant. Colonel Johnson said warmly. You're a good fellow, Poirot. With those words of commendation, the two men started out. It was a constable who opened the front door to them and saluted. Behind him, Superintendent Sugden advanced down the hall and said. Glad you've got here, sir. Shall we come into this room here on the left, Mr. Lee's study? I'd like to run over the main outlines. The whole thing's a rum business. He ushered them into a small room on the left of the hall. There was a telephone there and a big desk covered with papers. The walls were lined with bookcases. The chief constable said, Sugden, this is M. Hercule Poirot. You may have heard of him. Just happened to be staying with me. Superintendent Sugden. Poirot made a little bow and looked the other man over. He saw a tall man with square shoulders and a military bearing who had an aquiline nose, a pugnacious jaw and a large flourishing chestnut-colored mustache. Sugden stared hard at Hercule Poirot after acknowledging the introduction. Hercule Poirot stared hard at Superintendent Sugden's mustache. Its luxuriance seemed to fascinate him. The superintendent said. Of course I have heard of you, Mr. Poirot. You were in this part of the world some years ago, if I remember rightly. Death of Sir Bartholomew Strange. Poisoning case. Nicotine. Not my district, but of course I heard all about it. Colonel Johnson said impatiently. Now, then, Sugden, let's have the facts. A clear case, you said. Yes, sir, it's murder right enough, not a doubt of that. Mr. Lee's throat was cut, jugular vein severed, I understand from the doctor. But there's something very odd about the whole matter. You mean? I'd like you to hear my story first, sir. These are the circumstances, this afternoon, about five o'clock, I was rung up by Mr. Lee at Adelsfield Police Station. He sounded a bit odd over the phone, asked me to come and see him at eight o'clock this evening, made a special point of the time. Moreover, he instructed me to say to the butler that I was collecting subscriptions for some police charity. The chief constable looked up sharply. Wanted some plausible pretext to get you into the house. That's right, sir. Well, naturally, Mr. Lee is an important person, and I acceded to his request. I got here a little before eight o'clock, and represented myself as seeking subscriptions for the police orphanage. The butler went away and returned to tell me that Mr. Lee would see me. Thereupon he showed me up to Mr. Lee's room, which is situated on the first floor, immediately over the dining room. Superintendent Sugden paused, drew a breath and then proceeded in a somewhat official manner with his report. Mr. Lee was seated in a chair by the fireplace. He was wearing a dressing gown. When the butler had left the room and closed the door, Mr. Lee asked me to sit near him. He then said rather hesitatingly that he wanted to give me particulars of a robbery. I asked him what had been taken. He replied that he had reason to believe that diamonds, uncut diamonds, I think he said, to the value of several thousand pounds had been stolen from his safe. Diamonds, eh, said the chief constable. Yes, sir. I asked him various routine questions, but his manner was very uncertain and his replies were somewhat vague in character. At last he said, you must understand, superintendent, 
that I may be mistaken in this matter. I said, I do not quite understand, sir. Either the diamonds are missing or they are not missing, one or the other. He replied, the diamonds are certainly missing, but it is just possible, superintendent, that their disappearance may be simply a rather foolish kind of practical joke. Well, that seemed odd to me, but I said nothing. He went on, it is difficult for me to explain in detail, but what it amounts to is this, so far as I can see, only two persons can possibly have the stones. One of those persons might have done it as a joke. If the other person took them, then they have definitely been stolen. I said, what exactly do you want me to do, sir? He said quickly, I want you, superintendent, to return here in about an hour, no, make it a little more than that, say 9.15. At that time I shall be able to tell you definitely whether I have been robbed or not. I was a little mystified, but I agreed and went away. Colonel Johnson commented. Curious, very curious. What do you say, Poirot? Hercule Poirot said. May I ask, superintendent, what conclusions you yourself drew? The superintendent stroked his jaw as he replied carefully. Well, various ideas occurred to me, but on the whole, I figured it out this way. There was no question of any practical joke. The diamonds had been stolen all right. But the old gentleman wasn't sure who'd done it. It's my opinion that he was speaking the truth when he said that it might have been one of two people, and of those two people one was a servant and the other was a member of the family. Poirot nodded appreciatively. Trace bien. Yes, that explains his attitude very well. Hence his desire that I should return later. In the interval he meant to have an interview with the person in question. He would tell them that he had already spoken of the matter to the police but that, if restitution were promptly made, he could hush the matter up. Colonel Johnson said. And if the suspect didn't respond? In that case, he meant to place the investigation in our hands. Colonel Johnson frowned and twisted his mustache. He demurred. Why not take that course before calling you in? No, no, sir. The superintendent shook his head. Don't you see, if he had done that, it might have been bluff. It wouldn't have been half so convincing. The person might say to himself, the old man won't call the police in, no matter what he suspects. But if the old gentleman says to him, I've already spoken to the police, the superintendent has only just left. Then the thief asks the butler, say, and the butler confirms that. He says, yes, the superintendent was here just before dinner. Then the chief is convinced the old gentleman means business and it's up to him to cough up the stones. Hum, yes, I see that, said Colonel Johnson. Any idea, Sugden, who this member of the family might be? No, sir. No indication whatsoever. None. Johnson shook his head. Then he said. Well, let's get on with it. Superintendent Sugden resumed his official manner. I returned to the house, sir, at 9.15 precisely. Just as I was about to ring the front door bell, I heard a scream from inside the house, and then a confused sound of shouts and a general commotion. I rang several times and also used the knocker. It was three or four minutes before the door was answered. When the footman at last opened it I could see that something momentous had occurred. He was shaking all over and looked as though he was about to faint. He gasped out that Mr. Lee had been murdered. I ran hastily upstairs. I found Mr. Lee's room in a state of wild confusion. There had evidently been a severe struggle. Mr. Lee himself was lying in front of the fire with his throat cut in a pool of blood. The chief constable said sharply. He couldn't have done it himself. Sugden shook his head. Impossible, sir. For one thing, there were the chairs and tables overturned, and the broken crockery and ornaments, and then there was no sign of the razor or knife with which the crime had been committed. 
the chief constable said thoughtfully. Yes, that seems conclusive. Anyone in the room? Most of the family were there, sir. Just standing round. Colonel Johnson said sharply. Any ideas, Sugden? The superintendent said slowly. It's a bad business, sir. It looks to me as though one of them must have done it. I don't see how anyone from outside could have done it and got away in time. What about the window? Closed or open? There are two windows in the room, sir. One was closed and locked. The other was open a few inches at the bottom, but it was fixed in that position by a burglar screw, and moreover, I've tried it and it stuck fast, hasn't been open for years, I should say. Also the wall outside is quite smooth and unbroken, no ivy or creepers. I don't see how anyone could have left that way. How many doors in the room? Just one. The room is at the end of a passage. That door was locked on the inside. When they heard the noise of the struggle and the old man's dying scream, and rushed upstairs, they had to break down the door to get in. Johnson said sharply. And who was in the room? Superintendent Sugden replied gravely. Nobody was in the room, sir, except the old man who had been killed not more than a few minutes previously. Colonel Johnson stared at Sugden for some minutes before he spluttered. Do you mean to tell me, Superintendent, that this is one of those damned cases you get in detective stories where a man is killed in a locked room by some apparently supernatural agency? A very faint smile agitated the superintendent's mustache as he replied gravely. I do not think it's quite as bad as that, sir. Colonel Johnson said. Suicide. It must be suicide. Where's the weapon, if so? No, sir, suicide won't do. Then how did the murderer escape? By the window? Sugden shook his head. I'll take my oath he didn't do that. But the door was locked, you say, on the inside. The superintendent nodded. He drew a key from his pocket and laid it on the table. No fingerprints, he announced. But just look at that key, sir. Take a look at it with that magnifying glass there. Poirot bent forward. He and Johnson examined the key together. The chief constable uttered an exclamation. By Jove, I get you. Those faint scratches on the end of the barrel. You see, M. Poirot. But yes, I see. That means, does it not, that the key was turned from outside the door, turned by means of a special implement that went through the keyhole and gripped the barrel, possibly an ordinary pair of pliers would do it. The superintendent nodded. It can be done, all right. Poirot said, the idea being, then, that the death would be thought to be suicide, since the door was locked and no one was in the room. That was the idea, M. Poirot, not a doubt of it, I should say. Poirot shook his head doubtfully. But the disorder in the room. As you say, that by itself wiped out the idea of suicide. Surely the murderer would first of all have set the room to rights. Superintendent Sugden said, but he hadn't time, Mr. Poirot. That's the whole point. He hadn't time. Let's say he counted on catching the old gentleman unawares. Well, that didn't come off. There was a struggle, a struggle heard plainly in the room underneath, and, what's more, the old gentleman called out for help. Everyone came rushing up. The murderers only got time to nip out of the room and turn the key from the outside. That is true, Poirot admitted. Your murderer, he may have made the bungle. But why, oh why, did he not at least leave the weapon? For naturally, if there is no weapon, it cannot be suicide. That was an error most grave. Superintendent Sugden said stolidly. Criminals usually make mistakes. That's our experience. Poirot gave a light sigh. He murmured. But all the same, in spite of his mistakes, 
he has escaped this criminal. I don't think he has exactly escaped. You mean he is in the house still? I don't see where else he can be. It was an inside job. But, Tout de Meme, Poirot pointed out gently, he has escaped to this extent, you do not know who he is. Superintendent Sugden said gently but firmly. I rather fancy that we soon shall. We haven't done any questioning of the household yet. Colonel Johnson cut in. Look here, Sugden, one thing strikes me. Whoever turned that key from the outside must have had some knowledge of the job. That's to say, he probably has had criminal experience. These sort of tools aren't easy to manage. You mean it was a professional job, sir? That's what I mean. It does seem like it, the other admitted. Following that up, it looks as though there were a professional thief among the servants. That would explain the diamonds being taken and the murder would follow on logically from that. Well, anything wrong with that theory? It's what I thought myself to begin with. But it's difficult. There are eight servants in the house, six of them are women, and of those six, five have been here for four years and more. Then there's the butler and the footman. The butler has been here for close on 40 years, bit of a record that, I should say. The footman's local, son of the gardener, and brought up here. Don't see very well how he can be a professional. The only other person is Mr. Lee's valet attendant. He's comparatively new, but he was out of the house, still is, went out just before 8 o'clock. Colonel Johnson said. Have you got a list of just who exactly was in the house? Yes, sir. I got it from the butler. He took out his notebook. Shall I read it to you? Please, Sugden. Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Lee. Mr. George Lee, MP, and his wife, Mr. Henry Lee, Mr. and Mrs. David Lee. Miss, the superintendent paused a little, taking the words carefully, Pilar, he pronounced it like a piece of architecture, Estravados. Mr. Stephen Farr. Then, for the servants, Edward Tresillian, butler. Walter Champion, footman. Emily Reeves, cook. Queenie Jones, kitchen maid. Gladys Spent, head housemaid. Grace Best, second housemaid. Beatrice Muscombe, third housemaid. Joan Kench, between maid. Sidney Horbury, valet attendant. That's the lot, eh? That's the lot, sir. Any idea where everybody was at the time of the murder? Only roughly. As I told you, I haven't questioned anybody yet. According to Tresillian, the gentlemen were in the dining room still. The ladies had gone to the drawing room. Tresillian had served coffee. According to his statement, he had just got back to his pantry when he heard a noise upstairs. It was followed by a scream. He ran out into the hall and upstairs in the wake of the others. Colonel Johnson said. How many of the family live in the house, and who are just staying here? Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Lee live here. The others are just visiting. Johnson nodded. Where are they all? I asked them to stay in the drawing room until I was ready to take their statements. I see. Well, we'd better go upstairs and take a look at the doings. The superintendent led the way up the broad stairs and along the passage. As he entered the room where the crime had taken place, Johnson drew a deep breath. Pretty horrible, he commented. He stood for a minute studying the overturned chairs, the smashed china, and the blood bespattered debris. A thin elderly man stood up from where he had been kneeling by the body and gave a nod. Evening, Johnson, he said. Bit of a shambles, eh? I should say it was. Got anything for us, doctor? The doctor shrugged his shoulders. He grinned. I'll let you have the scientific language at the inquest. Nothing complicated about it throat cut like a pig. He bled to death in less than a minute. 
No sign of the weapon. Poirot went across the room to the windows. As the superintendent had said, one was shut and bolted. The other was open about four inches at the bottom. A thick patent screw of the kind known many years ago as an anti-burglar screw secured it in that position. Sugden said, according to the butler, that window was never shut wet or fine. There's a linoleum mat underneath it in case rain beat in, but it didn't much, as the overhanging roof protects it. Poirot nodded. He came back to the body and stared down at the old man. The lips were drawn back from the bloodless gums in something that looked like a snarl. The fingers were curved like claws. Poirot said. He does not seem a strong man, no. The doctor said. He was pretty tough, I believe. He'd survived several pretty bad illnesses that would have killed most men. Poirot said, I do not mean that. I mean, he was not big, not strong physically. No, he's frail enough. Poirot turned from the dead man. He bent to examine an overturned chair, a big chair of mahogany. Beside it was a round mahogany table and the fragments of a big china lamp. Two other smaller chairs lay nearby, also the smashed fragments of a decanter and two glasses, a heavy glass paperweight was unbroken, some miscellaneous books, a big Japanese vase smashed in pieces, and a bronze statuette of a naked girl completed the debris. Poirot bent over all these exhibits, studying them gravely, but without touching them. He frowned to himself as though perplexed. The chief constable said. Anything strike you, Poirot? Hercule Poirot sighed. He murmured. Such a frail shrunken old man, and yet, all this. Johnson looked puzzled. He turned away and said to the sergeant, who was busy at his work. What about prints? Plenty of them, sir, all over the room. What about the safe? No good. Only prints on that are those of the old gentleman himself. Johnson turned to the doctor. What about bloodstains, he asked. Surely whoever killed him must have got blood on him. The doctor said doubtfully. Not necessarily. Bleeding was almost entirely from the jugular vein. That wouldn't spout like an artery. No, no. Still, there seems a lot of blood about. Poirot said. Yes, there is a lot of blood, it strikes one, that. A lot of blood. Superintendent Sugden said respectfully. Do you, er, does that suggest anything to you, Mr. Poirot? Poirot looked about him. He shook his head perplexedly. He said. There is something here, some violence, he stopped a minute, then went on, yes, that is it, violence, and blood, an insistence on blood, there is, how shall I put it, there is too much blood. Blood on the chairs, on the tables, on the carpet, the blood ritual? Sacrificial blood? Is that it? Perhaps. Such a frail old man, so thin, so shriveled, so dried up, and yet, in his death, so much blood. His voice died away. Superintendent Sugden, staring at him with round, startled eyes, said in an odd voice. Funny. That's what she said, the lady. Poirot said sharply. What lady? What was it she said? Sugden answered, Mrs. Lee, Mrs. Alfred. Stood over there by the door and half whispered it. It didn't make sense to me. What did she say? Something about who would have thought the old gentleman had so much blood in him. Poirot said softly. Who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? The words of Lady Macbeth. She said that, ah, that is interesting. Alfred Lee and his wife came into the small study where Poirot, Sugden and the chief constable were standing waiting. Colonel Johnson came forward. How do you do, Mr. Lee? We've never actually met, but as you know, I'm chief constable of the county. Johnson's my name. 
I can't tell you how distressed I am by this. Alfred, his brown eyes like those of a suffering dog, said hoarsely. Thank you. It's terrible, quite terrible. I, this is my wife. Lydia said in her quiet voice. It has been a frightful shock to my husband, to all of us, but particularly to him. Her hand was on her husband's shoulder. Colonel Johnson said. Won't you sit down, Mrs. Lee? Let me introduce M. Hercule Poirot. Hercule Poirot bowed. His eyes went interestedly from husband to wife. Lydia's hands pressed gently on Alfred's shoulder. Sit down, Alfred. Alfred sat. He murmured. Hercule Poirot. Now, who, who? He passed his hand in a dazed fashion over his forehead. Lydia Lee said. Colonel Johnson will want to ask you a lot of questions, Alfred. The chief constable looked at her with approval. He was thankful that Mrs. Alfred Lee was turning out to be such a sensible and competent woman. Alfred said. Of course. Of course. Johnson said to himself. Shock seems to have knocked him out completely. Hope he can pull himself together a bit. Aloud he said. I've got a list here of everybody who was in the house tonight. Perhaps you'll tell me, Mr. Lee, if it is correct. He made a slight gesture to Sugden and the latter pulled out his notebook and once more recited the list of names. The business-like procedure seemed to restore Alfred Lee to something more like his normal self. He had regained command of himself, his eyes no longer looked dazed and staring. When Sugden finished, he nodded in agreement. That's quite right, he said. Do you mind telling me a little more about your guests? Mr. and Mrs. George Lee and Mr. and Mrs. David Lee are, I gather, relatives. They are my two younger brothers and their wives. They are staying here only. Yes, they came to us for Christmas. Mr. Henry Lee is also a brother. Yes. And your two other guests. Miss Estravados and Mr. Farr. Miss Estravados is my niece. Mr. Farr is the son of my father's one-time partner in South Africa. Ah, an old friend. Lydia intervened. No, actually we have never seen him before. I see. But you invited him to stay with you for Christmas? Alfred hesitated, then looked towards his wife. She said clearly. Mr. Farr turned up quite unexpectedly yesterday. He happened to be in the neighborhood and came to call upon my father-in-law. When my father-in-law found he was the son of his old friend and partner, he insisted on his remaining with us for Christmas. Colonel Johnson said. I see. That explains the household. As regards the servants, Mrs. Lee, do you consider them all trustworthy? Lydia considered for a moment before replying. Then she said. Yes. I am quite sure they are all thoroughly reliable. They have mostly been with us for many years. Tresillian, the butler, has been here since my husband was a young child. The only newcomers are the between maid, Joan, and the nurse valet who attended on my father-in-law. What about them? Joan is rather a silly little thing. That is the worst that can be said of her. I know very little about Horbury. He has been here just over a year. He was quite competent at his job and my father-in-law seemed satisfied with him. Poirot said acutely. But you, madam, were not so satisfied. Lydia shrugged her shoulders slightly. It was nothing to do with me. But you are the mistress of the house, madam. The servants are your concern. Oh yes, of course. But Horbury was my father-in-law's personal attendant. He did not come under my jurisdiction. I see. Colonel Johnson said. We come now to the events of tonight. I'm afraid this will be painful for you, Mr. Lee, but I would like your account of what happened. Alfred said in a low voice, 
of course. Colonel Johnson said, prompting him. When, for instance, did you last see your father? A slight spasm of pain crossed Alfred's face as he replied in a low voice. It was after tea. I was with him for a short time. Finally I said good night to him and left him at, let me see, about a quarter to six. Poirot observed, you said good night to him. You did not then expect to see him again that evening. No. My father's supper, a light meal, was always brought to him at seven. After that he sometimes went to bed early or sometimes sat up in his chair, but he did not expect to see any members of the family again unless he specially sent for them. Did he often send for them? Sometimes. If he felt like it. But it was not the ordinary procedure. No. Go on, please, Mr. Lee. Alfred continued. We had our dinner at eight o'clock. Dinner was over and my wife and the other ladies had gone into the drawing room. His voice faltered. His eyes began to stare again. We were sitting there, at the table, suddenly there was the most astounding noise overheard. Chairs overturning, furniture crashing, breaking glass and china, and then, oh, God, he shuddered, I can hear it still, my father screamed, a horrible, long-drawn scream, the scream of a man in mortal agony. He raised shaking hands to cover his face. Lydia stretched out her hand and touched his sleeve. Colonel Johnson said gently, and then? Alfred said in a broken voice. I think, just for a moment we were stunned. Then we sprang up and went out of the door and up the stairs to my father's room. The door was locked. We couldn't get in. It had to be broken open. Then, when we did get in, we saw. His voice died away. Johnson said quickly. There's no need to go into that part of it, Mr. Lee. To go back a little, to the time you were in the dining room. Who was there with you when you heard the cry? Who was there? Why, we were all, no, let me see. My brother was there, my brother Harry. Nobody else. No one else. Where were the other gentlemen? Alfred sighed and frowned in an effort of remembrance. Let me see, it seems so long ago, yes, like years, what did happen? Oh, of course, George had gone to telephone. Then we began to talk of family matters, and Stephen Farr said something about seeing we wanted to discuss tea. NGS, and he took himself off. He did it very nicely and tactfully. And your brother David? Alfred frowned. David? Wasn't he there? No, of course, he wasn't. I don't quite know when he slipped away. Poirot said gently. So you had the family matters to discuss? Air, yes. That is to say, you had matters to discuss with one member of your family? Lydia said. What do you mean, M. Poirot? He turned quickly to her. Madam, your husband says that Mr. Farr left them because he saw they had affairs of the family to discuss. But it was not a concealed a famille, since M. David was not there and M. George was not there. It was, then, a discussion between two members of the family only. Lydia said. My brother-in-law, Harry, had been abroad for a great number of years. It was natural that he and my husband should have things to talk over. Ah. I see. It was like that. She shot him a quick glance, then turned her eyes away. Johnson said. Well, that seems clear enough. Did you notice anyone else as you ran upstairs to your father's room? I, really I don't know. I think so. We all came from different directions. But I'm afraid I didn't notice, I was so alarmed. That terrible cry. Colonel Johnson passed quickly to another subject. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Now, there is another point. 
I understand that your father had some valuable diamonds in his possession. Alfred looked rather surprised. Yes, he said. That is so. Where did he keep them? In the safe in his room. Can you describe them at all? They were rough diamonds, that is, uncut stones. Why did your father have them there? It was a whim of his. They were stones he had brought with him from South Africa. He never had them cut. He just liked keeping them in his possession. As I say, it was a whim of his. I see, said the chief constable.